so we'd like to begin in prayer, and I'd like to call on Doc, Dr. Lance Dixon to lead us in our opening prayer. Great, thank you, Bonnie, so much, and and hello, everyone. I am just so excited to be here, and and I'll have an opportunity to introduce myself a little bit more later. But um, in introducing this prayer, I wanted to just take a moment and and just share with you the context because I think it's going to provide even more meaning as we're invited into uh, the words and the and the place of prayer in the context of this Advent season. Uh, so, in my work with the school district. A lot of what we do is um, trying to find and seek ways to make our schools caring and welcoming environments for our students and their families. And I'm always curious as to what other uh, communities and regions um, here in Canada and around the world are doing. And I, I, I stumbled across this beautiful expression of welcoming from the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. So to our American friends, thank you for all the work that you're doing. And, and we're going to include this now in this moment. Um, it's, it's a wonderful prayer that was given to every single high school student within their diocese. At this time, as Bonnie alluded to, when many people think about returning back to the church, to its life of worship at this time of Christmas, they wanted to know that there was a special blessing and welcome for these young people as they as they came back into the fold and experienced Christmas again and all the wonder and joy and hope uh, that is embedded in that in that moment that we live together. And this was the prayer that they invited the young people to say as they came back into mass and, and joined the church. And, and in that spirit, I'm going to invite us to say this prayer as well. And now, as Bonnie said, there's 400 people uh, or so um, in this time. And I know Zoom is always an awkward uh, place to all speak together. I'm going to invite us, though, because these words are for you, they are personal for each one of us to be welcomed into the presence of Christ. I am going to invite you in all the messiness of Zoom to just quietly in our hearts Say this prayer as I say these words together, okay? So, in the presence of God, let's come together, joining in the sign of the faith, in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, help me to be present to you in this moment. Jesus, help me to be still and at rest. Jesus, help me to know you, see me, know me, and love me. Jesus, help me find your peace amidst my anxieties and worries. Jesus, help me to have courage in the midst of all my fears. Jesus, help me to recognize the ways I have turned away from you. Jesus, help me to seek your forgiveness. Jesus, help me discover my life's purpose. Jesus, help me to know I belong to your family, the church. Jesus, help me recognize your presence at Mass. Jesus, help me to worship well, recognizing you are God and I am not. Jesus, help me to follow you with my whole life. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. Thank you so much, Lance. What a beautiful prayer. And it really touched our organizing team when we knew it was being shared with students across the archdiocese, because youth and young people and Catholic schools have a special place in our hearts. And so thank you so much for sharing that prayer. So joining the many of you and our conversation tonight are two men of faith that I greatly admire and will be our keynote speakers tonight. So I'd like to introduce them to you. The first is Father Troy Nguyen. Father Troy, are you on the screen? 
So I am. Okay. We, I'm just, there, there we are. Okay. Uh, Father Troy is a priest of the Diocese of Calgary, currently associate at St. Bonaventure Parish. Father Troy is also the chaplain for St. Vincent de Paul Central Council, and he's associate chaplain of the St. Francis Xavier Chaplaincy and stationed at St. Mary's University. Father Troy discovered his faith and vocation at the Benedictine Monastery in Mission, BC. Right. He went on to study for the priesthood, and he completed his BA in philosophy. Father Troy then left the seminary for a period of time to decide if the priesthood was truly for him. After working in the bank for several years and getting an education degree, he again felt called to the priesthood. Father Troy completed his Master's of Divinity in Theology and has now been ordained as a priest for four whole years. You can see he looks young and he is young. Welcome, Father Troy. Thank you so much, Bonnie. It's, good it's to my be pleasure to introduce Dr. Lance Dixon. Lance was ordained an Anglican priest in 1996 in Toronto. While he was completing his doctoral studies in organizational leadership, he and the director of the Catholic Worker Movement in Lower Downtown Toronto founded a community of missional hospitality. Around 10 years ago, Lance joined the Catholic community and moved to Alberta to begin a new ministry as a teacher in Catholic education. I was blessed to be Lance's first principal at St. Joseph's Collegiate in Brooks, so I'm going to take credit for bringing you to Alberta, Lance. Uh, but since his move west, Lance has served as a high school chaplain, a religious education consultant for Calgary Catholic School District, a director of campus ministry at St. Mary's University, and most recently, Lance is supporting Calgary Catholic Schools in their work of promoting racial equi equity and belonging and for student well-being and success. So we are both honored and privileged to be sharing um, this evening with both of you. So thank you so much for being here. And as well, I would wanted to um, recognize that we are being supported this evening by the Diocese of Calgary's Catholic Pastoral uh, Center staff. So we have Father Wilbert Chin John, who's moderator for the Korea here. We have Hui Nguyen, the Director of Pastoral Ministry, and Leah O'Hara, the Communications Coordinator, as well as Monica Ottenbright, Administrative Assistant. Our Bishop, Bishop William McGratton, is unable to join us as he's fulfilling his roles as President of the uh, Canadian Conference for Catholic Bishops. He is in Rome with the Holy Father right now, and it's 3 a.m. in the morning in Italy, so we decided he didn't have to attend this meeting. So he sends his prayers and his regrets for his absence. So what will this evening look like? Um, we've organized in sort of three segments. The beginning and first segment is um, for us to take some time with our own personal connection with the idea of welcome. The second segment will be an exploration and conversation about um, why does welcome matter to God's people, to those of us who are people of faith, to our churches? Why does it matter? And, uh, you know, sort of what are the connections there? And in the third segment, we'll be considering what are we being invited to do? What practical actions do we have? What, how do we answer God's call to be invitational and welcoming? And though Zoom has created a revolution of opportunities for us to gather with people across our country, in fact, across our continent, because we have some American listeners with us, sometimes it becomes a way of kind of distancing ourselves from each other. Uh, it, it can become a convenient way of being distracted and, and unengaged. We can shut off our screen and continue to finish up on some work of some other kind. So given the theme and the topic tonight, I would really ask you to please keep your screen on. Your face represents you as a person tonight, and we're talking about people, humanity, and being present. So I, I would just invite you to make every effort to uh, uh, turn your screen on and, and let us see your beautiful face. We want to be able to welcome you, and there's nothing more challenging than speaking to a blank screen. As well, I wanted to let you know that there will be two times this evening when we will gather in a small group. And they'll be formed quickly and randomly in groups of about four. And we ask you to participate. Um, it's so important that we not only are welcomed, but that we welcome others. And we need to listen and be a part of that conversation. 
being part of a uh, of renewal means taking some risks, sometimes stepping out of our comfort zone. But I can personally guarantee you that at the end of this evening, you're going to say, what I enjoyed the most was the small conversations. So please be prepared with your screen on and your willingness to be a part of that as those opportunities arise this evening. So let's begin. I poured myself a, a cup of tea. Oh, I see it comes in with the blurring screen. And I hope that you've done the same. And I just invite you to be a part of this evening. Okay, we're gonna begin by putting our guest speakers to the test. Um, the opening question that I'd like to um, ask both of you, beginning with Father Troy and secondly with Lance, what do we mean when we ask the quest or when we make the statement, welcome home? What does that mean? And secondly, what's your experience of welcome? When's a time when you felt welcomed and why was it welcoming? And just invite, first of all, Father Troy to respond. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie, for moderating and just being here with us and guiding us in this conversation. And home is such a beautiful word. When we think of the word welcome home, it's just, it just feels so wonderful, so amazing. And when you think of home in our own experience, we know that you know home is this place of comfort. When we think of home, I think of like, this is where you let your hair down or you just are able to be who you are. And it's a place that isn't just familiar, but where we belong. And so coming back, I'm thinking about several, several experiences in my own life. And we all know that experience of wanting to be home, right? If you've ever been on a trip for a long period of time, and although the trip has been amazing, you're always looking forward to coming home. And some of that means practically, you know, sleeping in your own bed, some little comforts that you experience. In some ways, it speaks to our desire that we're not meant to be nomads, that we're supposed to find this place of rest. And home then is this place where I'm safe, where I don't have to pretend, and where I'm valued and where I belong. And so that's this, that's that's the the home of word, the, the word of home is so rich in that way. And so when we speak of home in that natural sense, what we kind of want to explore today is what what do we mean by home in a spiritual sense, especially with regards to the church? And we can do that by reflecting on our experiences of welcome that we've had. And so, although, you know, the church can't be exactly like our homes in many different ways, it can be a home insofar as it's, it's this place where I'm safe, where I don't have to pretend, where I feel valued and I belong. And so one of my experiences of being welcomed actually came from university. And I was invited to this, basically this uh, university Catholic house. And there's a bunch of people there. And I think that's the first thing that was really important that I was invited, that someone wanted to be, to be there, hoped for me to be there. And that's, I think that's really important, especially when we think about uh, our, our experience of welcome. And when I was there, we're all, we're naturally, I was naturally greeted by the first person I saw. And it's very normal. Like we all experience, Hey, how's it been? What's going on? And it wasn't just asking about my life. It was, they were excited to see me. And it just kind of gave a sense of warmth in my own heart to be able to, to know like, ah, okay, this is, this is something <clears throat> these people want me here. They're excited to see me here. And <clears throat> in some ways, what I found throughout the night is that because I invested so much in the relationships in the university, it was basically a series of the same sequence of events throughout the rest of the night. So I'd be, I'd go for one person and have them say, Hey, how are you doing? And go to the next person. Hey, how are you doing? It's like kind of, it was like kind of like groundhog day, but in a good way, but with a different person each time. And so the first half of the night was basically saying hello to everybody. And then the second half of the night was basically saying goodbye to the people I didn't say hello to. And by the end of the night, we all have that experience. Maybe you had it too, where, oh, that, it was just too short. I wish I could spend more time. I, I, I don't want to go. And and when I re reflect on, back on that experience, you know, why was it so welcoming? And I think it was so welcoming because I felt known and loved. People knew me and I knew them and we wanted to be in communion with one another. And not only that, but just desired as well too. I missed you. I'm happy to see you. In some ways for me, when I think back on that experience, it's in some ways an icon of heaven. What I mean by icon is that this experience points deeper into a spiritual experience of what heaven could be like. I'm not saying heaven is like a university house party, but what I mean by 
this is an icon of heaven is that this is a timeless moment. These are timeless moments of knowing and being known by our closest friends and by sometimes even complete strangers of always saying hello and never having to say goodbye. And most importantly, of knowing and being known by God. And so I think when we reflect on these experiences of welcome, they invite us to reflect deeply. Wow, why, why was that so unique and so special? And I think at the heart of it is that you are known by someone and you get to know others as well too. And I think really that's at the heart of welcome for me. And that's all I have to share. Thanks so much, Father. I'm going to keep that idea of heaven as a university frat party. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Lance, could I call on you to answer those two questions? What do we mean mm. when we say welcome home? And mm. uh, what's your experience of welcome and, and why was mm. it welcome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bonnie, um, what it means for me, welcoming home, is actually the story of the prodigal son. And I, I want to just reflect on that story in, in two levels, uh, because I, I think really, particularly at this time of the season, for me, it has it has two meanings. But that, that first one is the story of the son himself, um, th this journey of returning back to a person to whom he mattered and belonged this father, and all of the trials and tribulations that this son endured at that time of being away. So it is that returning to me that means the welcoming home. But it's also that journey that we bring back with us into that home. Now, I want to speak about this personally in terms of an experience I had of being welcomed. Um, I was in my ah, early 20s, and um, I had left high school with really no clear idea of life at all. Um, and that's my own doing. I didn't pay attention in school. I wasn't really attentive to very much at all. Ironically, I know here I am a teacher, but that's God's humor. But here we are, early 20s, and I'm finally just feeling this need of, 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 of an anchor in my life, a place to root myself spiritually. And at this time I was in Toronto, and a, and a friend told me about this church in central Toronto. And he said, you know, I know some people that, that go there. It's a, it's a good place. Uh, these people are nice and, and, and try it out. And, and I got to tell you, I was nervous getting on to the subway and then transferring over to the streetcar and make my way down to where this church was located because I didn't know if I'd be welcomed. I'm a young mid-20s in the city of 4 million people, and, and this really mattered to me of finding a place where I felt like I could just be rooted somewhere. I was sort of tired of drifting through life. Well, to make a long story short, Bonnie, I walked in to the doors of that church, and by God's just providence. The person that I encountered was a woman by the name of Elsa Jones. And Elsa Jones looked at me and she said, oh, you're new. And I said, yeah, it's my first time. And I'm looking around. I don't know where to go. I don't know, if, you know, and she said, all right. And she grabbed my hand and she took me down the aisle and she said, you're sitting with me today. And Bonnie, that was it. She introduced me, I think, to almost every single person in that church congregation that morning. I don't even remember. Uh, you know, it was such a blur. But she said, you're coming back next week. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'll come back next week. And I, and I did. And I went back the next week and the next week. And I tell you, Bonnie, that sense of just being welcomed. And within months, she started calling me her son her son. And I can't tell you what that word meant to my heart, because that's what I was longing for. A place where I had an identity that was deeper than just a name on the street or a person over there. A son was deeply relational. It meant that I was part of a family. And it brought me back to a profound passage, even spiritually, 
where in uh, the letter to Galatians, St. Paul's writes, now look, by becoming part of the Christian family, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, you are also an heir through God. And that spoke to me about a purpose in life. So what happened as a result of that? I discerned my call to ministry. I was ordained a deacon in this parish. I was ordained a priest in this parish. And, and being within the Anglican tradition, I was married in this parish. And our first daughter was baptized in this parish. All because that one person grabbed a hold of my hand and said, you're coming with me. That's beautiful. Last, did you say her name was Elsa? Elsa Jones. I'll never forget her, even oh. all these years. She's on her way to sainthood, it sounds like. <laughs> In That's my heart, she is. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. What a beautiful story. Well, that's a great way for us to begin this evening, two stories of welcome and encounter and, and some thinking about what made those um, opportunities for welcome. We're now going to go in to some small group sharing of our own. If I could ask Kui to bring up this, this slide um, that has the questions on it. And, and I guess I would just again reiterate, please don't be anxious. God's calling us to not be afraid. He says renewal is going to take you moving out of your comfort zone, taking some risks, and being a place where um, you listen and connect with others. So you are going to have 20 minutes to talk with your group of four about what is your experience of welcome? When is the time that you felt welcomed? And as you listen to each of those four people share their insights or experience, then you'll come back as a small group and say, well, what was common with those stories? What did we notice was maybe the same or contributed to the feeling of welcome that we had? So listening, first of all, to stories and sharing of welcome. And then secondly, what made those experience, experiences welcoming? Um, I'm going to ask that whoever's birthday in your small group is next, whoever has the next upcoming birthday is the one who kind of takes charge and says, let's get started and um, kind of keeps things going. I also ask that as you gather in that small group that you take a moment to introduce yourselves and give your name and, uh, you know, where you're, you're speaking from, your local parish or community, and uh, and then to um, discuss those two questions. If you feel that you might forget them, you might wanna jot them down um, because you won't be able to see the screen when you go into small group. So just to review, what is your experience of welcome? What's a time when you felt welcomed? And as you listen to those stories, what was it that you had in common? What made those experiences welcoming? You will have a notice come up on your screen uh, a few minutes before your call back. And um, the, the wonder of technology is going to do it all for us. Okay, so we'll go into our small group suite. Chance to uh, to hear some stories of welcome, and and what it says to you in terms of your own life and and in the call you have to be part of a parish. Um, we're going to go now to um, sort of that second stage of understanding at a deeper level what does welcome mean to us as God's people and we're going to go back uh, to our guest speakers to Lance and Father Troy so I'm just going to ask Quee to bring us to that screen so this is kind of uh, the heart of the conversation I see Lance is there. So I'm, uh, we're going to start this time with, with Lance speaking first and then Father Troy secondly. But these are the questions I've asked them to consider. Um, what does the concept of welcome mean and why does it matter? Why is it important to us as people of faith? And why is it vital to our parishes? And how do you see our way forward in making our parishes inviting? So we're going to invite Lance to speak to that question first, and, and then we'll ask Father Troy to, and then depending on time, I will ask them some further questions based on what we hear. So Lance, if we could start with you, what's your response to some of those ideas? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. And welcome back, everybody. Um, just two two quick things. I'm, I'm going to answer that first question first, and then I'm going to invite Father Troy to share, um, because he might want to build on it and add something, and then maybe move into those other questions about why this is important to us as people of faith and how we move forward. Uh, so if I could do it that way, um, I'll, I'll kind of jump in. And um, Despite finding a love for academics and study, I really do enjoy getting to the practical ideas, and I know that's where we're going to be going uh, by the end of uh, tonight, really looking at some ways that we can live this out. But it is important for us to have a really clear understanding of what we are being called into uh, from the perspective of our, of our faith and the theology that informs us. Um, Henry Nouwen um, uh, often remarked in his writings and conversations that if there is one word that we need to reclaim as Christians, it is the word of hospitality. And when I think about the concept of welcoming, hospitality, that ministry of hospitality, really is the concept at the forefront. And when I think about that word hospitality, I see a really important word inside that word. And you're probably all recognizing it with me. The root of hospitality is that word hospital. And I sit with that word and I think about it in the context of Pope Francis, who often shares this beautiful description of the church itself as a field hospital. And this is him speaking in this quote here. I see clearly that the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. And so when I think about that welcoming home, it reminds me of what people are bringing back into the place of our worship and congregation. They've been on a journey in the world and we don't know how that journey has impacted them. The pains or the experiences, the disappointments that they have endured and they're bringing that back into us. Many people are gonna come back uh, for Christmas and who knows what they've experienced since the last time they have been in church. So I love this image of the church being a field hospital. But I have learned uh, through my own experience of leading a community house of hospitality that this image is both beautiful and deeply challenging because many come through our doors, wounded, lonely, completely unsure about the relationship with God. And for some people so angry with the world, that they're looking to pick a fight with God. And guess what? We are the first person they set their eyes on when they walk into church. Eric uh, Law, who's an Anglican pastor and theologian, wrote a series of books on creating welcoming congregations uh, for diverse and sometimes uh, segregated racial communities. And we know that even in our city of Calgary, as our communities change, and the people who make this city a place where they're living, as all that changes, we all have different stories and different experiences of church, and we find ourselves having to navigate all that. So he talks about inclusion in one of his books related to this idea of welcoming home and, and creating a space of belonging. And Eric Law says that actually this whole work of welcoming and hospitality is a discipline. And I, I think that's really important that we hold on to that word and, and, and really embrace it. It's a discipline of consciously extending the boundaries of our communities to embrace and affirm people of diverse backgrounds and experiences that really may be messy and bring some hurt and bring some confusion uh, into the mix and it's our work, as Pope Francis is describing, to heal those wounds and to warm their hearts. So in short, 
that concept of welcoming home really is that ministry of hospitality as a discipline of blessing each person who comes to our doors as if they were Christ himself. So I'm going to pause there to allow Father Troy to just speak from his own perspective, I think, on just, just the concept of, of welcoming home before we move to the next questions. Yeah, I think it's so beautiful to break down that word, hospitality, and just to see the importance of of being healing for others. And so for me, when I think of the, of the concept of hospitality and welcome and why it's so important is I think of the opposite of it in some ways. It helps us to think of the positive of something by looking sometimes at the opposite. And I had this, uh, like I said, I had a great experience in university of being welcomed by so many people, but that took time and work and effort. One of my first experiences of being part of a university community was not as glamorous. One time we were coming to adoration all together, and then they said they were going to do sandwich making afterwards. I'm like, okay, great. Because at this point, I just left from seminary, and I didn't know anybody. And I was like, okay, I don't have to awkwardly try to meet people. I can just stand and make bread and try to make some conversation. And after adoration was finished, I had my loaf of bread, and I went to the back. And when I went to the back, you know, everybody was talking to one another, and and nobody was making any bread. So I was like, oh, no, this is going to be weird. I have to like try to talk to people now. And I just felt so nervous and so shy. I just took that piece of bread. I just put it on the table and I just left. And it, it was tough. It was tough to, to be in a place where we feel you're in a crowd and you feel so alone. And I think sometimes many people experience that where they're trying to break in. They don't know how. And they try their best and then maybe they're too nervous or too shy or and and don't connect. And so some of the things I've realized with 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 our Catholic communities is that it's not that we are malicious, like we're trying to exclude people. I think what's happening in our communities is that we we just love being with the people that we know. And that's a natural thing. It's in some ways human nature. It's not like they're those people in that back were directly ignoring me. They were just happy to see each other and then indirectly ignoring me. It's still not a good feeling. Or maybe there's the other obstacle. So that's one obstacle to building welcoming communities. And the other obstacle is that sometimes I don't know what it means. People don't know what it means to be welcome. So they cannot give that same sense of welcome to others as well because we can't give what we don't have. And so it's it's so important to to be able to recognize this. And then when we don't feel welcome, we don't feel home. We don't feel valued, desired, that we belong. And in some ways, we recognize that we we have fallen short. Of course, the goal of this webinar is to, to empower you to create these communities of welcome. And of course, we've fallen short as a, as a church in whatever way, in many different ways. And we're not perfect at it. And we're trying, of course, but of course, we, you know, we, if there's any hurt, I know there's some people who maybe are hurt for whatever reason. And, you know, on my part, we just want to say sorry. We ask for your forgiveness. But through this webinar, we, we hope to be signaling that welcome is important to us. By speaking about it, encouraging it, and giving tools to properly understand it, we're hoping that you will join us in this mission so that people like me or other people who don't feel as welcome can be seen and known by you. You have something to do because what we're doing is we're welcoming people, not just because we don't want people to feel bad, but in some ways, when we don't welcome a person, in some ways, it's not in accord with their dignity. You see, we know that Jesus shed his blood for us. And that's just a concept that's beyond our imagining and our full understanding. You are worth the blood of the Son of God who is infinitely valuable. So when you think about that, if God, who is infinitely valuable, died for you, what is it saying about your dignity? In some ways, Jesus is trying to highlight the supreme value and dignity of each and every person. And so welcoming is so important for me. One, because of the opposite experience isn't the great experience either. But in some ways, too, when we truly welcome others, we truly allow them to experience the dignity that they have been given. And that's, uh, that's my answer for that first question. Back to you, Lance. 
Yeah, thank, I, I'm so glad that I invited Father Troy to speak because um, what what he's saying is just so vital, and it, um, and and we, I, I don't think we can emphasize enough even how Jesus placed hospitality at the center of his ministry. In fact, he even went so far at the end of Matthew's Gospel in chapter 25 as he's preparing to suffer precisely what Father Troy said for us on our behalf. He also called us to recognize our work in bearing witness of the kingdom through this um, call of welcoming the stranger. And he went so far as to say that so much as you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. Dorothy Day has this wonderful expression about seeing in the hurting and the lonely and the hungry Christ in his most distressing disguise. And I think that's the eyes that we're called to have as a church. And in doing so, we see Christ in all these unexpected places. And that's what gives us greater life and hope. Because we can look at our own brokenness, our own places of disappointment, our own moments when we have lost God and asked, where are you, God? Now in this discipline and practice of welcoming others in back home and walking with them and listening to their stories, inviting them in and helping them to see Christ, we begin to see Christ more clearly in our life. And I think that's why it's important for us. Following Christ in his example of welcoming others in all of their woundedness and messiness, it gives us life as the people of God. And I think that's the gift of doing this. Um, I wonder, I don't know, Father Troy, if you want to say more about that in terms of how it gives life and why it's vital to our parishes, and maybe even going to look at seeing our way forward um, now and making our parishes more inviting, that question. Um, but I, I leave it to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Lance. Yeah, no, it's uh, this this knowing our dignity that's been given to us from Jesus and he revealing that and and we spoke of the motivations, I think, which is important of why we should be welcoming other people. Because one, it's Christ present in them. And so we should be loving people. Yeah. Our love for Jesus should, should actually motivate us to, to, to welcome other people. As you said, like, when I was a stranger, you welcomed me. That's what Jesus says. And so he, he literally makes that a corporate work of mercy to welcome others. Uh, mm. Maybe I'll get weed mm. actually to, to show the screen with the uh, faith in flux. Um, kind of one of the reasons why people leave the church. And so kind of speaking of why welcome is so important. And so there's this, this statistic that uh, Bishop Barbarian uses, and it's uh, it's so important. He says that uh, for every one Catholic that joins the church, six leave. And for those of those, eight out of 10 of those who leave are under the age of 23. Now, in this study, they went through one of the reasons why, what are, why do, what are the reasons why these people left from the church? And there's a variety of them. Uh, but one that I think is really important for us to maybe focus on in reference to our parishes is this, that people leave the church, 71% of them leave the church because they gradually drifted from religion. And it doesn't say welcome or hospitality or something like that, but when you think of someone who's gradually drifted away, you think of someone who is in a boat, who's just kind of floating away from the shore, and they kept drifting because there's nothing holding them down. And so obviously I'm going to read into this stat a little bit. And I'm wondering whether maybe people drift away because they didn't have anything to hold on to in our faith. That there wasn't someone who who grabbed them and held them in. If uh, if we if you could go to uh the the quote from Isaiah chapter 43 this is, this is a beautiful quote. It says, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. And so when we think about it, if the priests in our parishes are preaching about a God who personally and intimately knows each of us, but then we don't even know each other's names. What kind of witness are we are giving, right? There's a there's a kind of contra witness, right? Where our faith is all about God personally knows us, but 
we barely know each other. And that's difficult. It's not a, a judgment, but that's a challenge, of course. And that's what we're trying to work with. There's an interesting story about a, this lady. She was traveling in the airport and she's a speaker. And then she was sitting down to have lunch. And she pulled out her phone and her rosary came, fell out. And a man who saw that, like, hey, are you Catholic? He says, yeah, yeah, I'm Catholic, very Catholic. He's like, well, yeah, I used to be Catholic. You know, I, I moved to a different parish. And when I was there, uh, nobody really knew my name. And so I kind of just left. Oh, and she says, you know, I'm sorry to hear about that. You know, that you you are desired. You you are, you do matter. And we, we would love to see you at the church. And then their conversation kind of continued. And he kind of came back to that point again. He said, you know, like, I, it kind of seems silly to leave because no one knew my name, but isn't that something that Jesus would want us to know about each other? And it really hit, hit this woman. She's like, wow, this guy was so wounded in some ways, so hurt. And so when I speak of why welcome is so important and vital to our parishes, it's not just because we have want more people or we don't try to raise more funds. It's because people and all of us desire to be known by name. And God mm -hmm. desires to know each of us by name. But the beautiful thing is that he invites us to be those instruments as well. And so to, to know other people by name. And so it's, it's so important. And it needs to be genuine in that sense. And so... Um, yeah, that's that's kind of my comments about why why uh, why it's so vital for our parishes. And I'll turn it back to you, Lance. Yeah, and I, I appreciate Father Troy um, speaking that word not in a place of judgment, but a place of call, a place of challenge. Because I think we're we've all been there. Some of us are there, where we are seeing a diminishing congregation. Um, I've been in situations where congregations are flourishing. And in every situation, I find myself humbled for what I have learned about faithfully participating in the kingdom of God, which really is what the ministry of hospitality is all about. We think about that parable, the wedding banquet. Go out, invite them in, invite them in, come to my banquet. And that banquet for Jesus is the metaphor of the kingdom of God. So how do we see ourselves moving forward and making our parishes more inviting? So I, I have four things I'm just going to quickly share from what I have learned, both in flourishing congregations and diminishing congregations. And I want to begin actually with the words of caution that Father Wilbert um, succinctly put at the very outset when he sent out the invitation for us to come together tonight. These are his words, and I think they're so important to really uh, begin when we think about moving towards the doing. Here's what, here's what he said, just to, just to refresh our memories. He said, Father Wilbert, there are not enough programs or resources in the world that will make your parish more welcoming. No mission and vision statements that can that can convey the actual experience of being cared for. That's a mic drop moment, you know, to, to borrow the expression from these young people today, right? So where do we go? Well, again, I just want to offer not four programs, but four principles that, again, I have learned. Here's the first thing. I have learned that our hearts must be convicted of the love Christ has for every person. This call to renewal that our diocese is participating in is as much about reigniting the gift of love before anything else. St. Paul just said it so succinctly when he spoke in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak of the tongues of mortals and of angels, but don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. People hear through that, in other words, sort of the, the, uh, the tinniness of our message of invitation. 
If I give away all my possessions and I hand over my body so that I can boast, but don't have love, I gain nothing. In other words, that sandwich that we hand to that stranger, to that hungry person, they'll just see it as a loaf of bread that will just make an empty stomach tomorrow. Jesus speaks of love as that deep abiding relationship, that relentlessness to see the very best for that person, spiritually, physically, in their whole being. So that's the first thing. Second thing, and I'll go through these quickly, I, I learned is that for the, mass, the vast majority of human beings, and this speaks so much to what Father Troy shared, both in that statistics and in his own experience, is that human beings want belonging, and that precedes believing. So belonging precedes believing. They will come to know and believe in God when they feel a sense of belonging in the family of God. And so the ministry of hospitality, I think, is why it's so central to Jesus' ministry. He knew that about human beings. Third thing is I learned how we need to approach the sacraments as God's gifts to us in the wilderness. The Catholic Church is so blessed to live in the full embodiment of these, these sacraments that have been given to us. And especially in the season of Advent, where we begin uh, renewing our hope in our faith journey. And then we're going to be invited deeper into the wonder of the miracle of Christ's birth. Let's bring that back into our worship and celebration, the wonder, the joy, the unexpected ah. presence of God in the messiness of our lives. And the most tangible ways of introducing people to Christ is truly through these sacraments. And the last thing is, um, and this might seem a little odd, but I've learned that we need to be clear about our identity as a faith community. And how does that tie into welcoming? Well, a, a, a little, little explanation here. I, I, first of all, I believe that the Holy Spirit gathers people to be a particular manifestation of the grace of Christ in a particular place in time for a particular purpose in the mission of the church. It's just kind of how the how the mystery of the Holy Spirit works in the church. When I was called to join the pastoral council of my parish um, presently, I felt compelled to listen to what gifts lie at the heart of our parish. What is fueling the enthusiasm for our ministries and worship to flourish? And I've been doing these video interviews of our ministry leaders using this uh, sort of process called appreciative inquiry, just loosely. And, and I got to tell you, I, I've, I've done four so far, and each one has been a wonderful testimony to their devotion and joy of service to this parish. And um, one ministry in particular, our RCA uh, ministry, has seen an exponential number of people joining. They, they just want to be part of the faith. And um, our last pastoral council, we spent half of the meeting trying to analyze all the factors, figure out the formula for the increase in numbers. And finally, after going back and forth and just being at a loss, Father Colin, our pastor, said, folks, I think we're just learning how to get out of the way. And, you know, I think about that comment. And I go back to what Father Wilbert and St. Paul are saying about all these programs and all of these things that we try to put in place. Nothing replaces simply loving people through the gifts the Holy Spirit has given us. And I think that's a church that finds life and meaning in the work together. And that life, I believe, ultimately is what attracts people from the street who are hungry for something life-giving and purposeful to belong to. So those are my four thoughts, the principles that I've learned. Uh, Father Troy, if you have anything to offer, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, no, I, I just have two. Um, and the first one, like going kind of going back to that motivation of, you know, why I think it's really important for us to to have our motivation clear of why are we welcoming people? Are we welcoming people just to increase our numbers or just to make more money or 
all those are important and good things, of course. But like I said, going back, like as Lance mentioned, we're, we're going back to the reason why we're doing this is because we want to serve Jesus in distressing disguise. But secondly, as well, too, to see the dignity of each person. And I think this has two implications, that when we're welcoming people, it's important to love them genuinely. Right? Because sometimes if we love them, we're like welcoming them so that we have an ulterior motive, then they can feel what happens is that they, becomes a, they become a means to an end. And nobody wants to be a means to an end, right? Like, oh, you're welcoming me because you want to do this or you want to involve me in this. We want to genuinely welcome them first, see them, know them by name, know their story. And as a result of that, they choose out of their own freedom, invited to do other things. And that's a totally different paradigm. And it's sometimes too, when we welcome others as well, something important to keep in mind that I had to learn my own way too, is that sometimes we want to welcome other people the way we want to welcome them rather than the way they want to be welcomed. And if they don't fit into our perceived categories, then it's like, ah, oh, I don't know how to welcome you then. It's like, well, so welcoming has to meet them where they're at. And I just had a, uh, uh, an example. Of, uh, I was at uh, a parish and we had a, a homeless man sleeping at the front of the church. And you want to be welcoming to this person who's obviously cold and doesn't have a home. And as I was doing that, you know, we're trying to get him some coffee, make him feel welcome. And, but then at, at the same time too, as I was reflecting, I was like, okay, am I helping this person so that they can be better off? Or am I helping this person so that I don't have to be bothered with them when I open up the church in the morning? And so I, I really had to rethink of my motivation for helping this man. It's good that he's not sleeping in front of the church as well too, but is it more because he's a nuisance or because I generally see and desire the good for him? And so in our welcoming, I think those are two important principles that we genuinely welcome others as an end in and of themselves rather than the means to some other end or goal that we have, but also to welcome them, not according to our categories, but meeting them where they're at. Wow. This is very, very rich. So many great ideas. So many things to think about. Thank you to both of you. Um, I would like you in your small groups, we're going to take 15 minutes, we so just 15 this time, um, ask you to just speak in your small groups of what did you hear uh, from Lance and Father Troy that really resonated with you or sparked some questions or response, uh, what caught your attention. And if you have time to even move into what does that mean practically for me in my community, in my church, in my parish, in my own situation. So we'll take 15 minutes and then we'll return for our final segment as a wrap up. Lots and lots to talk about. So Father Troy and Lance, you've done a great job of uh, giving us rich, rich material to be reflective about, to pray about, and to discuss in our small groups. Uh, we're just down now to the last 20 minutes or so of our time together. So I'm going to ask our guest speakers to close and then uh, we have a few things that we'd like to share before we um, all depart. Uh, I'm going to start with Father Troy and then secondly go to Lance this time around. And the question for you or the insights we'd like to hear from you is what encouragement or advice can you offer us um, as we put welcome into practice? How can you leave us, give us some inspiration mm -hmm. uh, and, and send us forth, you know, kind of on a high, uh, excited to, uh, to be welcoming. Father Trey, I'll start with you. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, hopefully uh, sometimes to talk about the good news, we got to know a little bit about the bad news. and then, <laughs> But definitely want to speak of the goodness that is happening. And we know that welcoming, as we've been talking about, is an act of love. And there's a lot of welcoming that is happening, and the effects of it are amazing. For example, at St. Mary's University, uh, there was a student who sent me a message and he said, hey, Father Troy, I'd like to be confirmed. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then I met up and I talked with him. He's like, yeah, you know, I was baptized Catholic, but my parents never took me to Mass. And so we just, uh, I just kind of grew up trying to figure out where I was going to go. And and uh, since going back to St. Mary's University, I've been coming to Mass. And now I, I want to be confirmed Catholic because I was never confirmed. I'm like, oh, okay, like what motivated you to want to do this? He's like, the people were just so welcoming. I, I just felt like, I, I didn't have to prove myself that I was welcomed as I was. I was like, wow, that's so beautiful. So our our love and our welcome for other people 
can bring them into the church. And in some ways, you are become a, a reflection of God's love through your welcome. But in some ways, not just a reflection in a Catholic sense, this light comes from within yourself because God has transformed you into his likeness. And so this light of God's love comes from you and it shines on them and they see this light. And so some things that, uh, maybe some advice, some things that uh, like I'm kind of trying to do as well in my own work is, for example, we're going to have a family board game night. And at this family board game night, there's going to be an adoration as well too. As we know, for parents, sometimes they feel a little nervous about bringing their kids to church. And so what we're going to do is actually we're going to have a family adoration. And so before adoration begins, we're going to say, if your kids are crying, don't take them out. Keep them inside. And so making parents feel comfortable like, hey, if your kids are crying, this is a family adoration. That's fine. It, it, it's, it's all good. And so kind of giving them permission to be. Uh, another thing that's kind of practical that we're doing at uh, St. Francis Xavier Chaplaincy as well, too, is that we're going to have ushers at the doors. We're going to say, hey, I haven't seen you before. Oh, I've seen you for a couple of weeks. What's your name? And then the idea is to catch them and then eventually lead them into the hall where at the after the end of Mass to be able to connect them with other people. Because really, sometimes it's hard to break into a community, but all it takes sometimes is just one person. I was talking with uh, Lorna. She was saying, you know, I moved to a different place and I just knew one person in that community and that got me in. And now I feel so welcome and connected with so many different people. And But most simply this, you know, what I want to encourage all of you is this, is that just, I encourage you just to meet one new person next Sunday. Ask for their name and their story. What brings you here? And that's, that's, that's how we implement God's desire for us to be known by him by name is that if we know their name, that's a you're applying that, that theological biblical principle. And the whole principle behind this and why, why all of you are here is that you want to make the Catholic Church more welcoming. And so I really encourage you to take that initiative that you can make a difference in our churches, every single one of you. And of course, working with your pastors, of course, to to build up the community, but each of you can make an impact right now and it can change generations. So imagine if 200 or 400 of you from this webinar go out and you start, you invite and you welcome one person, you know them by name and you invest in that relationship for one or two relationships for two years. Over time, over a 42 year period, you can, you can radically change the world. And this is not just a theory or a number that I'm speaking of. That's what the early Christians did. Do you know the early Christians began with approximately 1,000 people? This is from Rodney Stark, who is a sociologist. Around 1,000 Christians around 40 AD. And by the 4th century, they, they multiplied to 30 million people. And there are a variety of reasons for why Christianity spread so much. Because of their bravery and persecution, their high moral standard, the sacraments, the charity and love they had for others. But one of the principles that was so important for this growth of Christianity was this fellowship to all social levels. They welcomed all people, rich, poor, men, women, slave, free, people of different races, everybody. And that's something that we can begin our renewal as well too by remembering how the early Christians did it through welcome as one of the principles, there's many more, but by implementing that in our lives, I think we can change our diocese and I believe our world as well. Thank you. You want me to jump in, Bonnie? Yes, please. It seems like my internet's yeah. a bit fady, so thanks, Lance. Okay, okay, no problem. Um, no, I I am excited about uh, the things that are happening and that we can do even now. Um, so I'm going to share with you actually, if uh, Hui, if you could bring up uh, those slides that I um, shared with you earlier today, um, and as um, as Hui is getting those ready, just want us to go back to Father Wil Wilbert's word. What I'm sharing with you isn't programs. I like to think of them as vehicles. 
ways that we can practically embody this love that we're called to share and the joy of our faith. Two things I want to share in this uh, that, that can be lived out today in this Advent season. I know that many parishes are already kind of set in terms of what they're offering and kind of the, the, the amount of time and energy now we have to take on new ideas. But maybe, maybe in a small way, there is a group that wants to just kind of pick these up and run with it. Um, this article I mentioned right at the beginning, how so much of my work is really about curating all these great ideas that we can implement in our schools. Well, this is a this was a great article um, I, I found about you know specifically within this Advent season um, how we can welcome newcomers. Now, you're all going to get these slides, so you don't have to worry about writing all of this down. But these are just some of the uh, strategies that they talked about. I loved this concept they had about thinking about organizing your church programs from the outside in. So rather than thinking about those people who are already inside and what speaks to them, Think about how you can organize your activities so that they are accessible and relatable to those who might be joining you from the outside, those guests, those newcomers, those just kind of trying out church at this time of year because, I don't know, that's kind of what you do at Christmas, you go to church. So what does your church look like from the outside in? And focus on the both and. Uh, in other words, if you're going to do something for kids, let's, and Father Troy just spoke about this so well, and let's include something that the adults can enjoy. Um, if you're doing something for the newcomer, how can we make this also something uh, for those that feel like they've been here for a long time and they have a meaningful role in this, uh, in this event or welcoming uh, activity? Uh, so I'll leave that with you. Those are the QR codes uh, that lead you to this uh, really helpful article. Next one, Hui. We'll just go through these quickly. So I am so fortunate. I uh, My office and team is located in our district reception center called our St. John's Reception Center, downtown Calgary. And that is where every family from around the world who arrive in Calgary and want to enroll their ch child in one of our schools, that is their point of entry. And so we meet people every day arriving to Calgary from all around the globe. And I was just talking, there's a, there's a Christmas tree in the, in the hallway of our, um, of our center. And this child was just kind of enthralled with the tree. And, and I just passed, by and I stopped and I said, this is a beautiful tree. And he kind of looked at me and I sort of realized um, then that, oh, okay, probably not English is uh, uh, what this child's comfortable with, but the mother came over. And I, again, using this appreciative inquiry model that I've been just kind of learning and trying, and I'll share it with you in a minute. I said, tell me your best experience of Christmas. And she began to share with me this Los Posadas tradition in Mexico. And it, it was a wonderful tradition that she was sharing that there's nine days from the 16th to the 24th of December, leading up to Christmas, communities would process down through the village and knock at each door, the children leading uh, with candles, dressed in angels, a Mary and Joseph, and they would knock on the door and this would all be kind of planned by the adults that the first door would not let them in. And they would sing carols to try to encourage this family to open the door. And they, they just wouldn't, so they'd have to go to the next and the next and the next until the planned house said, come on in and they'd have a feast and there'd be pinata and celebration. And they did this every day, nine days leading up to Christmas, Los Posadas. And Posadas means an inn a dwelling, and the reenacting that bleak midwinter night when the Holy Family was trying to find a place in which Jesus, the Savior of the world, 
can be brought into our midst. And the loneliness that they experienced in that journey of finding a place of refuge. And I thought, what, what a beautiful catechesis for these children. They're building empathy for what Mary and Joseph experienced in trying to provide a place of welcome for our Lord. This is such a simple thing that you can reenact. It's almost like that Christmas pageant, but it celebrates the diversity of our cultures and how we bring to life this gospel story and how children can learn through it. The next one, um, I want to shift a little deeper. These Those were Advent kind of moments. I talked about the videos that I was doing and this appreciative inquiry. Again, you're going to receive this video, but what I have found so valuable in really building an appreciation for who we are as a family of God is listening to people's stories. And it's not difficult. You can have three questions and phrase it in any way you want. And it is amazing. The depth of what you hear about people's lives in that moment. So the first thing is tell me your best experience of whatever the topic is of Christmas, as I just shared with you, about this mother and her child in the middle of our St. John's Reception Center. What's most important to you right now in life? And you'll find a lot of reasons why they're standing in front of you in the church. And what, what is your wishes? What's your hope? What, 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 thinking about the future for your family, your, your, your parish, yourself. And that speaks about their journey of faith, why they're seeking God. I hope for healing. I hope for a job. I hope for uh, a purpose in life. I hope we have a wonderful Christmas celebration. I hope to find friends. And it goes on and on and on. So appreciative inquiry is something that we can intentionally bring into our conversations with people. And it's just a simple, effective model. And the very last thing I want to share with you, um, and this goes even deeper, in terms of the ministry of hospitality, the last thing, if you could change that slide, thanks, uh, we. I really want to encourage us to think about faith formation as that next step beyond the front door. When they are in, our work doesn't end. In some ways, it only begins because they need to see the consistent, persistent life of grace in that community. Mm -hmm. We talked about the hurt and the wounds and the questions. Those aren't solved in a day and a month and even a year. Our faith formation needs to live in this context of grace and hospitality. And so this is a wonderful resource developed by a Catholic education um, association in Ontario, um, this document actually we um, says that there's plans to implement it here within our own diocese in Calgary, which is exciting. Um, and you can see here again some of the principles that they've really shaped faith formation around. And it's all based around the spirit of hospitality and grace. So I really encourage you to go back to your parish and think about every step along the way from the moment they walk into the door to the time they're standing at the altar receiving the sacrament of Christ, how are we practicing the ministry of hospitality for them to know that no matter who they are and no matter the stumbles and steps they take along the way, they are welcome here and they belong and they matter and we are walking each other home to Christ. The very last thing I want to share with you is simply a book. Some people just like sitting down and reading and reflecting, and I highly recommend this book uh, by uh, Christine Pohl, who passed away actually earlier just this year, a remarkable theologian and pastor in own right, making room, recovering hospitality as a Christian tradition. And really, again, in the spirit of Henry Nouwen, who says there's so much in this word for our faith communities to reclaim and unpack and to live. And she just does a masterful job of just capturing that throughout the history of scripture right up into our current day. So I leave that with you. Maybe a great Christmas gift 
for that person who you still haven't quite figured out what to get yet. So there we are. And so thanks we for sharing that. Wonderful, Lance. So many great ideas there. Thank you so much. Um, the time has flown by as I was afraid it would, and I knew it would. I just, I, I didn't have a chance to ask questions of our speakers, but I just want to highlight a few things that are on my mind as, as we draw this evening to a close. Father Troy, I really was taken by your um, description when you went back to make sandwiches and saying that you ended up leaving. And you said that people weren't necessarily trying to exclude. They just wanted to be with the people that they knew. I think that's really got something to unpack about how we get so comfortable in our friendships and in the people we know that it's not even intentional, the idea of excluding. You also said people can drift away because nobody's holding them. And you talked about the drift of especially our young people. And then you called us to um, see Christ more clearly as we welcome others. That's how Christ will be revealed to us. Lance, I'm going to hold on to St. Elsa, who took you by the hand when you first walked in and led to you becoming a pastor, a minister, an educator, a husband, a father, all those things from a very um, kind, generous, outreaching woman in the, in the parish. That was powerful. Also, your idea of hospital being the root word of hospitality and how Pope Francis reminds us um, that our parishes and churches are field hospitals, all those who are wounded and hurting and angry, and we don't even know uh, what's at the root of it, but that that's there. That's where they're at right now. And then you're just very rich, practical ideas, resources for us, which we will make available to others. Um, so much here that we really appreciate. So special yep. thanks. We uh, can't, maybe we'll do a virtual clap uh, to both Lance Dixon and Father Troy Nguyen, who have just really enriched this evening. And then I'd like to call on Father Wilbert, who's going to close us um, with some resources that the diocese has available. All right, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Father. I'd like to speak on behalf of the leadership team. I recognize that um, a few of us are here on the chat um, with we and Leah. Uh, the work of Bonnie, we just want to recognize your work, Bonnie. Um, you have been amazing, uh, not only in leading the renewal team leadership, but uh, in hosting this event tonight. So thank you very much. Thank as you, always. Father. Thank you. Now, Hui is going to post an image on the screen of a uh, mini product that we are producing for this season of Advent and Christmas. And it's this one. It's a little note that is four and a half by four and a half. So it's a square, professionally printed. We printed 60,000 of them that we will make available in all the parishes of the diocese. We will figure out the distribution um, and we will make sure that your parish will get copies of these cards as soon as possible. These cards have been printed so that they can be made available to everyone in the parish who would like to use them. And it's to break the routine and to surprise someone. So for example, I can imagine if you're sending a uh, Christmas card or a present, giving a present to someone, or even when you're at the office um, and you're working, uh, let's say in the oil and gas field, there is someone that you just want to know that they are cared for, prayed for and loved. You would be using this card and perhaps secretly place that on their desk. And on this card, it will say, with this card, I want you to know and remember that you are loved. Whatever you're going through and whatever is in your heart, take comfort that God knows and walks beside you, praying for you this Christmas. And with the scripture passage there, it talks about the peace that comes from God, which surpasses all understanding. And then on the front of the card is this cute image of uh, baby Jesus as a way of really conveying that simple gesture of care and love for someone. So it might be someone close to your family, someone you work with, someone in the school, perhaps. These, uh, this becomes like a tool that you can use to reach out to someone who may need it. And you never know who the Lord wants to receive this card. 
because sometimes it just takes a message like this to really make a difference in someone someone's life. We also invite you, you can use this card to show appreciation to perhaps people in your parish already um, who may be um, in ministry or in whatever way you, you find um, would be fitting for the use of that card. Father, were you sharing anything else? The Advent oh, resources, sorry. Bonnie. Yeah. We're you going to talk about this. Okay. Where you are. Oh, no, I wasn't going to. I think oh, you were, okay. Father. Okay, sorry. All right, I'm sorry. So we are, have prepared um, a collection, a curation of the different things that are happening in our diocese um, that deal with Advent events like missions, retreats, concerts. We truly believe that Advent is a good time for us to renew our um, connection with the Lord and invite others to do the same. So we can invite them to any of these events. So there are great resources available for families. And there's a list as well of penitential services that are happening and the Christmas mass times, which we will also advertise. And um, there will be ways of uh, serving others as well that would be available during the season of Advent and Christmas. And what we're hoping is that people would take advantage of them as a way of connecting or reconnecting with a community. And we move to the next slide. So there's the Advent mission that's taking place at St. Michael's um, Catholic Church. So December 18 at 7 p.m. and up to Wednesday, December 20th, 7 p.m. So this is called to be missionary disciples with Peter Thompson. In fact, Peter I saw is in this um, webinar as well, um, participating here tonight. And it will be live streamed as well on YouTube, um, especially for those who do not live in Calgary, but would like to participate in this mission. Parish renewal gatherings. Oh, hi, Peter. <laughs> so parish renewal gatherings. We had those large gatherings in four different locations for um, the renewal, and the response has been amazing and really beautiful time with each other. And um, it was a great time to be around the bishop. Now, the goal is to inform and engage parishioners with the call that we are being um, asked to do, which is the renewal of our faith. And not only as parishes, but also as individuals and as an entire diocese. So for those of you who attended the renewal gatherings in November, um, please feel free to reach out to your pastors or to your priests and to perhaps talk about organizing your own gatherings in the parishes, um, especially when you are, let's say, a member of the parish council. This is an opportunity to bring people together and it doesn't happen, it doesn't have to happen this December because people might be very busy with all kinds of social events happening. But imagine the potential for something like this in the dreary months of January and February, where you can really allow for people to be engaged with one another. And lastly, we will be receiving an email from Leah from Communications, and she will be sharing the resources that were offered tonight and perhaps more, and they will be available as well on the renewal page. So we're hoping that you will visit the renewal page often because the, anything that is new will be placed there for people to um, access them. On behalf of the Bishop, I just want to thank you for being a part of tonight's webinar. There were 425, I believe, that signed up. And um, I think the highest um, attendance tonight was around 240 or 240-ish. And so I'm going to turn this over to you, Bonnie. Thank you very much, Father Wilbert. I add my appreciation to all of you. And I would ask Father Troy if you wouldn't mind closing us in prayer, Father. Sure, no problem. Well, let's close together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for all the people who've gathered here today, for our diocese, our bishop, our clergy, 
uh, those who work in administration, our parishes, or sacramental prep, just everyone who's just part of our parishes and are desiring to bring about this renewal in our diocese. We pray that your Holy Spirit may come upon them, may inspire their hearts, give them courage to witness to your love in our world, to be a minister of welcome for all people, especially those who are strangers and who are longing to be known and to be loved by you. We pray that as we learn all these different things and principles, that we may implement them in our daily lives, in small ways, in our parishes. And we pray that we may have perseverance to continue to walk along that path. And we also, as well, ask the intercession of our Blessed Mother, who knew best how to be this minister of, of welcome by welcoming her cousin Elizabeth and just ministering to her with great hospitality and love. And so we end and pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. We wish you the blessings of Advent and um, a beautiful, um, faithful, joyful Christmas. Good night.